Hey everyone, welcome to your lecture on the brain. Unfortunately, this is a unit I wish we could be in class to teach because there's so much more hands-on things that we can do to include dissection that we just can't do in a virtual setting, but we will do our best. When we talk about modern psychology, it goes hand in hand with neuroscience. How you feel, how you think, how you act, how you behave, how you form language, all of these things are decided by the brain. So for us to understand ourselves, we have to understand this organ. All mammals share a similar composition. You'll see that there's motor and sensory areas, and then you'll see that there's association areas. This is a simplified version of the brain. You'll also notice that as the animals become more complex, from rat to cat to chimpanzee to human, there are greater association areas. The basic components that less complex life forms develop are developed first in humans. So things like your brain stem, your limbic system, those things will develop first. And things like your prefrontal cortex, your decision maker, is going to be later in the formation. And in fact, we think that the final and kind of refining moments for an area of the brain like your prefrontal cortex doesn't happen until you're about 25, maybe even now 30. So our brains are changing and growing and refining themselves for a very large part of our lives. It wasn't until about the 1990s that we had really effective brain scans. Now, why does this matter? Why would a brain scan matter? Well, until we could actually look at an active human brain, the human brain was essentially a black box. We couldn't see in it. We had no idea what it was doing. And we had a lot of questions that couldn't be answered. But the minute that we could start looking at scans of the brain, we could see the brain operate as it was getting new information. It is important for you guys to know the different brain scans. And what I'm gonna tell you right now are really the quick, simple things that you need to know. So still make sure that you read your textbook, read through these slides, but I'm gonna give you the bullet points. The first one that we'll talk about is a CAT scan. It's CAT scan is also referred to as a CT scan. This is the most inexpensive of scans because it uses basic x-ray technology. This will give you a map of the brain. And really it's just a single shot x-ray of the brain as if you were getting an x-ray of really any other part of your body. It will literally just show you structure. We don't see the brain as it's active, we just see what it looks like. CAT scans are great for detecting things like tumors. An MRI is a step up from a CAT scan, and it doesn't use x-rays, it uses magnets. So magnetic fields and radio waves are used to detect the soft tissue of the brain and give us a 3D image. It'll take pictures from left to right and top to bottom, so two different planes, and what it'll let us see is really good structure of the brain. You can get a very detailed and very accurate picture and map of the brain using an MRI. An EEG doesn't have the same ability to show you pictures of the brain. What an EEG does is shows you the electrical activity going on inside the brain. We had talked about neurons in the last lecture. Neurons, when they fire, use electrochemical energy. The chemical comes in the form of the neurotransmitters, but the electrical charge is that action potential. Your brain actually emits an electrical field. So an EEG can pick up those different brain waves. When we get into talking about sleep and states of consciousness, we'll talk about how our brain waves actually change pattern. When you're awake, you're at beta. When you're getting drowsy, you're at alpha. Then you go into theta and then ultimately into really deep delta waves. Well, if we're looking at sleep disorders and we want to see how the brain is functioning, we're going to hook somebody up to an EEG. It'll let us know when that electrical energy, that change in wave pattern happens. PET scans and fMRIs are going to be our functional scans. What that means is they let us see the brain as the brain is being active. Now your brain is about three pounds and the average human can be anywhere from 120 to 200, 300 pounds. So in respect to your overall body weight, your brain is maybe about 1% of your overall body weight. But here's the amazing thing, that very minimal percentage is going to take on 20% of all of the oxygen and 20% of all of the glucose that your body utilizes. When we say glucose, we're talking about really essentially the energy source that your body utilizes to keep itself moving, keep it functioning. So PET scans and fMRIs work off of these things. 
your PET scan is going to have the person who's getting the PET scan take in a radioactive form of glucose. As the glucose travels through their body via their bloodstream, the areas of the brain that's consuming the most amount of energy are going to be the areas that are the most active. Therefore, the PET scan will pick up where the glucose consolidates and be able to read all of that radioactive material that is in that area, giving a person a really cool color-coded map of areas of the brain that are highly active and maybe less active. An fMRI does this, but it's a little different. It doesn't use x-rays, and it really just uses oxygen consumption and the same principles of an MRI. We're going to start talking about divisions of the brain, and there are three major regions, the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. Hindbrain being the oldest, midbrain being the area where we have the greatest amount of neurotransmitter production, and the forebrain, which is what we usually call the new brain. We'll start with the hindbrain. In the hindbrain, there are going to be three structures that you need to know. The brainstem is the oldest and kind of the central core of the brain. It's sometimes known as what we'll call the reptilian brain. You will see brainstems in any mammals, reptiles, essentially most living things that have or function with a brain will have a brainstem. Brainstems and hindbrain are not synonyms. The hindbrain consists of three structures that you guys need to know about. The cerebellum, the medulla, and the pons. If you look at the picture off to the left, you see that the brainstem actually includes other structures. The thalamus, which is a forebrain structure, and the reticular formation, which is a midbrain structure. So while it's really important and it has the areas for automatic survival functions, it's involved in regulating your circulatory system, your cardiovascular system, helping you with sensitivity and alertness, this is not the same thing as the hindbrain. It does contain nine cranial nerves, and it relates information from the body back to the cerebellum and to the cerebrum. The cerebrum is essentially that higher brain area. Again, when we're talking about the hindbrain, we're talking about the medulla and the pons. When we talk about the midbrain, however, we're talking about the reticular formation. So all the structures involved in the brainstem actually can be separated into other areas or locations in the brain. Let's start with some of the basics. So in the hindbrain, the first thing we'll talk about is the medulla. And the way that I get people to remember the medulla is I remember medieval death. And a long time ago, the best way to kill somebody would be to chop off their head. And where would you want to chop their head off? Right at the base of their skull, right at their neck. Well, your medulla, if you look at it in the picture, is right at the base where the spinal column meets the brainstem. Damage to this area in any way would shut down your ability to breathe, sneeze, cough, and circulate your blood. Sneezing and coughing is really important. It's a way to clear your airway, but not being able to breathe or circulate your blood, well, that would certainly be instantaneous death. The pons is a little bit harder. The pons is this neural fiber that connects the cerebellum to the brainstem. And a lot of people like to just remember that, but that's really not the most important part of the pons. It's not just this bridge that keeps the cerebellum attached to the brainstem. It actually is really important when we talk about dreams and sleeping. So when you dream at night, you can have really active brain waves. In fact, your brain is as active during a dream state as you are when you're fully awake. And if your body wasn't slightly paralyzed, you could act out really anything that's going on in a dream. We'll talk more about sleep disorders later, but the structure that keeps you paralyzed while dreaming is your pons. It actually shuts down the neural signals from your motor cortex in higher areas of your brain from reaching their intended destinations, like your muscles. So while you may feel like you were running or punching or flailing in a dream, your body was in fact frozen and paralyzed because the pons kept that message from ever making it to your body. It also helps with other things like arousal or fight or flight. This is how I try to get people to remember pons. You would never want to fall asleep in a pond. So you never want to fall asleep in a pons. Just the idea that sleep and kind of that sense of alertness is regulated by that structure. The last one that we're going to talk about for the hindbrain is the cerebellum. The cerebellum has several responsibilities, and the more we learn about the cerebellum, the more information that we're finding 
about how important it is to a lot of other functions. So it's often referred to as the little brain, and it's a very clear separate structure from the rest of the brain. Again, it's attached to the brainstem with the pons. And when we look at what the cerebellum can do, it helps coordinate voluntary movement, especially your fine motor skills. So if you've ever watched a child go from trying to maybe hold a pencil for the first time to your ability to write with a pencil now, that's a fine motor skill. The things that require a soft touch with the fingers, being able to coordinate the muscles of your hands in these really kind of small articulations so you can write words, that's all coordinated by your cerebellum. For those of you who play an instrument, think of the guitar and how small and kind of simple some of those very kind of fine motor movements are that change just the tone ever so slightly. Again, when we're talking about your cerebellum, that's what allows you to coordinate one hand strumming and the other hand changing chords. The cerebellum also has to do with our sense of balance. So it's our ability tied in with our vision and other senses that lets us understand where our horizon is. It's where our procedural memories exist. So when we get into memories, we'll talk about different types of memories. We have episodic memories, memories that are like television episodes about our life, and then we have procedural memories. Procedural memories are our how to do something. So could you close your eyes and tie your shoelaces? If the answer is yes, it's because you have a really good muscle memory or procedural memory for doing that activity. Now, memory doesn't exist ever in your muscles. The more often you build the neural connections in your cerebellum for a physical activity, the stronger you become in that because it is less time for those neurons to tell your body what to do. It also has a role in emotions, hearing, and touch. So for the cerebellum, I always tell everybody, think about getting your bell rung. If you were to get hit hard enough in the face, well, you might lose your balance. You might lose your ability to count on your fingers. You may find that things become ultimately much more difficult and something like a procedural memory like walking might all of a sudden go out the door. Now we're on to the midbrain. The lovely part about the midbrain for what you guys need to know is that you need to know one structure. Now that doesn't mean that there is only one structure in the midbrain. It just means that you only need to know one structure. The structure that you need to know in the midbrain is called the reticular formation. And I tell people to remember this by you react and form a response. Now the reticular formation has a strong role in what we'll call sleep and arousal, but I've already told you that before. I told you that with the pawns. The reticular formation does something very different. The reticular formation actually activates your fight or flight response. It's located in the brainstem, so it actually runs through the brainstem. You can see the pons here, the cerebellum, and just below the pons would be the medulla. The reticular formation runs through that entire structure and terminates just below the thalamus. This is what wakes you up, and if you've ever been really drowsy, closed your eyes and felt like you were out for about 10 seconds, you had something called microsleep. That's your reticular formation turning you off like a light switch. We usually think that sleep is something that we can choose or we can control. And the reality is sleep is a biological imperative. What that means is you need sleep whether you like it or not. And if you are sleep deprived, this structure in your brain will eventually shut you down. It will put you out. And it doesn't matter how much caffeine you drink or how many Red Bulls you take or five hour energies or whatever it might be. If you are that sleep deprived, this is the structure in the brain that will put you out. Here's the thing, damage to the structure can actually lead to coma. So this one has to do with getting us alert or aroused in a fight or flight sense, or the opposite, it has a lot to do with making us go to sleep. The last area we're gonna talk about is the forebrain. The hindbrain had three, the midbrain had one, the forebrain has a lot. The thalamus is a structure in the forebrain that most people seem to forget because it's very deep within the forebrain and it just, there's no great way to remember it. I always say the thalamus tells my senses. So TMS, thalamus, you see those three letters, tells my senses. The thalamus actually takes in sensory information 
from your eyes, your ears, your skin receptors, all of that information coming from the nerve cells that get translated into these electrical signals, they all get to the brain and the brain has to sort them and decide where to send them. The thalamus is that structure. Now, if you've ever met somebody who might possibly taste colors or every number that they see, regardless of the font that it's written in, has kind of a haze to it of a very specific color, well, those people are called synesthetics. Synesthesia, we believe, happens at the thalamus. That maybe signals that should go to the visual area might end up somewhere in the auditory area, or something in the auditory area ends up in the visual area, and so our senses get blended. A proper working thalamus will take all the information in from all of the sensory stimuli that is going on in your world, and it will correctly route it to the correct areas of the cortex in the brain for processing. So we don't see something just because a picture pops up in our head. We see something because our eyes take an image, break it into an electrochemical signal, neurons play hot potato with that signal, get it to the thalamus, and the thalamus registers that signal as a visual signal and then correctly routes it all the way to the back of our brain. That's a pretty amazing thing, especially since things seem to go where they're supposed to go and we see the world the way it's supposed to be seen for the most part. We'll spend a little bit of time when we get into sensation and perception watching a short video on synesthesia. It's pretty cool. Here you see that brainstem again. And I told you, the brainstem is not the same thing as the hindbrain or the midbrain, and here's where you can see why. The reticular formation, that bundle of nerve cells that runs through the brainstem, well, we already said that was a midbrain structure. The medulla that's all the way down at the bottom where the spinal column meets the brainstem, well, we know that's part of the hindbrain. And the thalamus sits there at the top taking in a ton of sensory information and then sending it back out to make sure that we process sensory information properly. So I told this story to my kids to see if I could teach them some basic neuroanatomy and it worked. So this worked for my kids when they were in second and third grade and maybe it'll work for you. Plus it's just a different way of looking at the information, turn it into a narrative and maybe we do a little bit better with it. So welcome to Limbic University. LU is home to many motivated, emotional, and memorable students. Meet Hippo. He is the resident hippo on campus. Much like an elephant, the hippo never forgets. Limbic University is home to the fighting brains. Hippo attends Limbic University with his very best alpaca friend, Amy G. Dalla. Amy is known to have a very short temper and become rather aggressive if you confuse her with a llama. Amy has a lot of other emotions, but Hippo always seems to remember her as Angry Amy. All right, let's see what you remember. What university did the two animals attend? They attended Limbic U, and that's because we're gonna talk about the limbic system. What could Hippo never do? Well, Hippo could never forget because the hippocampus is a structure in the brain for memory. And what would Amy become if you called her a llama? she'd become angry. Now that's because the amygdala is a structure in the brain that controls emotions and is primarily responsive to things like anger and aggression and really kind of all of those really strong fight or flight emotions. What function does the hippocampus provide? Memory. The amygdala? Emotion. So here we are at the limbic system. You guys should know the limbic system because it's very important to how you currently are functioning. The limbic system is really a border between the more primal areas of the brainstem and the more advanced areas of the cerebral cortex. It contains the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. The reason this is primarily important for you is that this area of your brain is fully developed as a teenager. The area of the brain that controls this and kind of regulates it well, that's not fully developed until you hit about 25, and we'll talk about that. Your hippocampus. Your hippocampus is your memory system. Now, most people wanna believe that this is like a storage system in the brain that files things away and is infallible and absolutely perfect. And the reality is, is that your memory system is a work in progress. It is something that it continually alters itself, it revamps itself, restores itself, and loses pieces. It's a really average storage system. 
And what the hippocampus does is that it actually excites neurons throughout the brain and stores information in very specific neural patterns. In other words, this is kind of the part that pulls all the pieces of the puzzle together to try to put together your memory. There is no such thing as a place that just holds memories. Your amygdala controls emotions, but primarily your fight or flight emotions, fear, anger, and aggression. Now, it might surprise you, and it might not, that evolutionarily, males have larger amygdalas than females, making them the more emotional of the two sexes. But it's the emotion that they have access to more often than women, which is anger and aggression. The hypothalamus is the last structure that we'll talk about in the limbic system. And unfortunately, I just don't have a great way of remembering it other than memorize it. The hypothalamus is the neural structure that lies just below the thalamus, so hypothalamus, but it doesn't have anything to do with your senses. It actually regulates your body temperature. It makes you thirsty or makes you feel like you're not thirsty, makes you hungry or not hungry. It's essentially your motivation center. And it's also your motivation for sexual attraction. I told you before, your memory system, your emotional system, and then the hypothalamus, which if you also remember from the endocrine system, controls the pituitary gland. All of this is fully online as you're going through puberty. So as you are 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age, all of this is completely online. The area of your brain that is going to control it and maybe even dampen some of those impulses, that doesn't really come fully online until about 25. Normally, you guys would have to know where all of these structures are and be able to label diagrams. In the virtual world, we just don't have that ability. So here's a lovely picture so you can see where they are. The cerebral cortex is going to be part of the forebrain that has a lot of different important responsibilities. This is that outer layer of the brain, the part that looks like a walnut. And it is where essentially all of our neurons are really kind of stored for all of the association areas that we make. We have about 30 billion neurons that can exist in a tissue layer one inch thick. And the cerebral cortex actually fits over your gray matter, almost kind of like um, a swimmer's cap. There's gonna be dips and grooves that allow more of that space to be covered by neuron dense tissue. If you took your brain out, please don't, but if you were to and take the cerebral cortex and flatten it out, it'd be roughly about the size of a large pizza. So you know that the easiest way to sometimes get things into spaces that they don't wanna be in is to crumple them up. I mean, most of you, I'm guessing if you looked at your drawers where you put your clothes, you can fit a lot of stuff in there if you just shove it in. Well, that's what evolution did with our brain. We can fit a lot more in our heads if we crumple it up and just kind of shove it in. We're gonna go through the major lobes of the brain. And as we go through them, I'm gonna let you know that there are some pretty important things. So we're gonna start out with the frontal lobe, this pink area. The frontal lobe, that's gonna be where your prefrontal cortex is. Your prefrontal cortex allows you to plan and make decisions. Yes, you guys can plan and make decisions, but sometimes your decisions are a little bit more fueled by emotion than maybe an adult brain. And yeah, you can plan, but maybe you're not as good at planning as maybe an adult or an adult brain. Your frontal lobe also includes what's called your motor cortex. If you choose to move, not a reflex, but if you choose to move, your motor cortex is what is allowing you to choose that. And as I'm speaking to you right now, I'm choosing to move my mouth to produce language. Well, that comes from an area called Broca's area. Broca's area is in the left hemisphere of your brain and it allows you to produce speech. This is the only time that you will hear me say left brain or right brain really is when we talk about what's called hemispheric specialization your language centers are in the left hemisphere of your brain. So the ability to move your mouth, left side of your frontal lobe, your ability to move your body, the entire part of your frontal lobe that is your motor cortex, your ability to plan, make judgments, decisions, well, that's your frontal lobe. Behind the frontal lobe is the parietal lobe. And the parietal lobe is a lobe of the brain that helps you with what I call 3D mental rotations. In other words, if you are looking at something, can you turn it in your mind's eye? Can you understand how it fits into space? 
Most of you have grown up playing video games, and you are good at video games because you have a parietal lobe. You can take an object that is essentially two-dimensional and work it through a maze or a level or whatever because your brain allows you to do this, and it's your parietal lobe that does it. Your parietal lobe is also where metaphors exist, and your parietal lobe is also where mathematic ability resides. If you think about it, math is essentially a metaphor. I tell you the word one and you assume that it means a single thing and so you are making these associations. Well, the other thing that your parietal lobe does is it has your sense of touch in an area called the somatosensory cortex. So, we're talking about the parietal lobe. Quick way to remember it, parking a car, P-A-R, parietal. If you have ever parallel parked a car, notice all of the P's and the P-A-R's, parallel park a car, this is what allows you to look at that car that you're driving, whether it's a minivan or a small sedan or maybe a huge SUV, and you can mentally visualize where all the corners of the car are. And it allows you to visualize that, yes, you could fit your car between two other cars. And as you parallel park your car with your parietal lobe, you might also touch the curb with the back wheel to make sure you're close enough. So there's your sense of touch. So 3D mental rotation, mathematical ability, and your ability to sense touch all happen in the parietal lobe. The occipital lobe, this one's super complicated. Occipital, optics, vision. There you go. But the cool thing about the occipital lobe, it takes up about a third of our overall activity. We like seeing things. It is our dominant sense. So when we get to sensation, expect to talk about vision. Your temporal lobe is right off to the sides near your temples, and it helps you hear a tempo. I know I'm speaking like an idiot right now, but just bear with me. Your temporal lobe helps you with hearing. So your temporal lobe helps you process the tempo and it's near your temples. In your temporal lobe, you also have Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is your area for language comprehension, your ability to understand language. We've talked about what your motor cortex does and your somatosensory cortex. Motor cortex allows you to move. Somatosensory cortex allows you to understand sense of touch. Here's a cool thing though. You can't move your brain and your brain actually can't feel anything. All it can do is process those things. Additionally, you're also cross-wired. Anything that's coming in from the left side of your body goes through the thalamus and is processed by the right hemisphere of the brain. Anything going on on the right side of your body goes through your body to your thalamus and then is shot over to the left side of your brain. So we're essentially cross-wired. Left goes to right, right goes to left. Here we're looking at something called a homunculus. And what you should be seeing is your motor cortex and your somatosensory cortex, but it's the human body graphed out on them. The cool thing about this is that areas that have greater motion and more intricate motion take up greater space, and areas that are far more sensitive take up greater space. We'll probably look at a video or two of how this stuff can kind of just be really cool when things maybe go wrong. But for us, we realize that we'll notice if a bug lands on our cheek, but we may not pay attention if a bug were to say land on our knee, or it might take a little bit more time for us to recognize it. We know that we can move our mouth in a huge amount of different ways to produce speech, to chew our food, to smile and make facial expressions. But we can really only move our hip joint really kind of in a circular motion. There's not a whole lot of articulation there. So when we look at our motor cortex and our somatosensory cortex, things that are more sensitive will take up more space. Things that have more ability to move and need more control will also take up more space. We have a left brain and a right brain. Now, I'm not saying that you are left brain to right brain, but you do have a left brain and a right brain, just like you have a left lung and a right lung, just like you have a left leg and a right leg. We don't talk about people having reliance on their left lung more than their right lung, unless maybe there is like a serious problem with one of those organs. So we don't just use half of our brain exclusively or rely on it more than the other half. 
But we do have a structure that allows the two halves of the brain to communicate to each other, and that's known as the corpus callosum. It's a large band of neural fibers that actually connect the two hemispheres. If you were to sever this red band that you're seeing right here, these millions upon millions of neural fibers, then information wouldn't pass between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. We'll spend some time in class talking about split brain procedure that brings to light how the brains are interconnected. But what's important for you to know is that this structure connects the two halves. And a cool fun fact, if you're left-handed, you have a larger corpus callosum than right-handed people. Being left-handed for I don't know what reason allows us to have greater connectivity between the two hemispheres of our brains. Here you're seeing the cerebral cortex and a longitudinal fissure. If you were to go right down the longitudinal fissure and separate the brains in half, what you would have to sever through is the corpus callosum. So it literally takes those two halves and kind of glues them together. This slide really just goes over some stuff that I've spoken about before. Your right and your left hemisphere. We do have hemispheric specialization, we just don't have hemispheric reliance. In other words, you're not left brain to right brain, but you do have certain areas of the brain that take on different activities. So in the left hemisphere, it is incredibly important for you to know the left side of your brain includes Broca's area from your frontal lobe that allows you to move your mouth and Wernicke's area that's in your temporal lobe and allows you to understand or comprehend language. Here you see these two areas and again, heavily, heavily important. If you are speaking, whether you're right-handed or left-handed, whether you like math and art and science or whatever, if you can speak, you're using the left hemisphere of your brain. Here again, we're seeing some things that are what we'll call brain lateralization or hemispheric specialization. Your brain has a certain amount of organization to it and certain areas of the brain are going to be where we house certain abilities. But if you go through any of these and you're like, oh, I'm rational and I can do math and science, but I'm also able to, I don't know, have emotional thought and I can be creative and I don't know, have a left field vision, then you're using both halves of your brain. So when someone tells you you're right brain or left brain, please understand they're misunderstanding a lot of research that was put out and they're kind of just twisting it. We do have some specialization, but if you've made it through basic math, if you can count to 10, well, then that's happening in your left hemisphere. And if you can draw a smiley face, well, now you're using your right hemisphere. We're not talking about being experts. We're just talking about having abilities. Split brain study is something we'll go over in class. And so right now, I'm just going to give you a quick run through. Split brain studies happened to come about in the 1960s, and we'll look at research that was done by uh, Roger Spurry and Michael Gazaniga. The surgery came about because people with extreme epilepsy, these extreme storms of electrical energy in their brain, well, they were suffering. And so they were looking for a possible way to stop epileptic seizures. One way that surgeons found is by severing the corpus callosum. Somehow taking the bridge out from the two hemispheres would actually reduce the amount of seizures people were having. Here's the big thing though. Anytime we talk about a surgery, especially a surgery on the brain, it has to be dire. This has to be a last resort kind of thing. What we found out is that personality and intellect didn't get touched one iota. Perception, however, was altered. What we found is that if subjects were asked to focus on a central point, their vision became what we'll call lateralized. And again, without kind of running you through some things, it's hard to kind of visualize. But what I mean by lateralized is what they saw to their left visual field would only get projected into the right hemisphere. And what got kind of put in the right visual field would only go into their left hemisphere. And I may have said that twice. So left would go into right, right would go into left. If they were looking at something and it was just hitting the periphery of their vision, let's say you had a football in the periphery of your left visual field and you had a baseball in the periphery of your right visual field. Well, that football would go into from your left visual field into your right hemisphere. You couldn't actually say you saw a football. In fact, you couldn't say football because you had no idea that there was a football or an image of a football in your right hemisphere. However, that baseball that was in your right visual field got projected into your left hemisphere. 
and you have broken Wernicke's area, you could speak about the baseball. But if asked to go point to what the person saw, the person who maybe saw the football in that left visual field would go over and only with their left hand would touch a picture of a football. But they couldn't explain to you why they had this image in their head or why they saw it. We'll spend a little bit more time in class talking about split brain procedure. Here's where I'm talking about the visual field. And again, if you're looking at a central object, what happens is that your vision does something called lateralizing. It goes into like two sides. The apple goes into the left hemisphere, even though it's in the right side. The left side pencil goes into the right hemisphere. And since speech is only located in the left hemisphere, the person could only say they saw an apple. Same example here. And just remember, this is only if we were to sever the corpus callosum. Most people have minimal effects from this. We'll look at the video in class and we'll run through a couple of examples to make sure that you guys are comfortable with this idea. There's another term that you should know and it's called plasticity. So if you think of the brain, think of it as something that is very malleable. And when you're young, the brain can reformat itself. It can do a lot of really cool stuff. It can heal itself. As we get older, the plastic is no longer as malleable as it once was. Your brain never loses its ability to heal or modify. It just isn't as efficient at it when you start to really become kind of concrete in where certain actions, behaviors, and neural connections have to take place. We do have one other psychosurgery you should know about, and that's called a hemispherectomy. This is an example of brain plasticity. In a hemispherectomy, again, this is going to be devised for people who have brain tumors or extreme epilepsy. They used to believe that you could remove half of the cerebral cortex. They would leave intact places like the limbic system, the thalamus, and the brainstem, but they would remove half of the entire cerebral cortex. So either half of the left hemisphere or half of the right hemisphere would be gone. That would include the parietal lobe, the frontal cortex, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. Hemispherectomies come back in the 40s and then later and again in the 60s because they become more successful as we become more adept at doing these surgeries. The drawbacks to a hemispherectomy. If you lose half of your cerebral cortex, if you lose half of your brain, let's say you lose the left side of your brain, you would lose Broca's area, Wernicke's area, so speech would be gone. You would be blind in half of each eye. So if it's your left hemisphere, your right visual field would be blind. You would be paralyzed and you would be essentially desensitized on half of your body. And if it was your left hemisphere, it would be the right side of your body. Flip it over and let's say we remove your right hemisphere. You would have issues with motion, sensation, vision, all on the left side of your body. Now here's the thing. We can successfully do this kind of surgery in very young children because they can actually develop those abilities on the other half of their brain that remains. You guys are far too old to do something like a hemispherectomy to. If we did it to somebody who was even as young as a freshman, their brain would be far too entrenched in its neural connections for their brain to kind of reformat itself. Two theoretical conclusions come from these psychosurgeries. There's no shift from one hemisphere to the other has occurred because lateralization of function is not present in early infancy. Well, what this just means is that we can do this with really young children because the brain hasn't really kind of started to format itself. Hemispheric differences are present early in life, but the brain also has the ability to reorganize itself. And we see this time and time again when we start talking about some other areas of the brain, um, when we talk about other special abilities of the brain, like memory. So that's it for the brain, guys. I know it's a lot. Um, and we're going through it rather quickly. We'll spend some time looking at some of the kind of interesting psychosurgeries and some of the intricacies of the brain. But this is going to be something that is the foundation of every unit going forward. So you will hear me reference these structures and their functions and what the brain can do. So we are now officially kind of into the heart of psychology and we're going to move forward and see what this amazing organ does for us.